a RAM 8 module holds eight 16-bit words and can be built using the register 16 component that we built in prior videos. So let's load that up first. And let's add one to our design. And so since it's a RAM 8, we need eight of these. Let's go ahead and, and define our ins and our outs, uh, and then we can move them around. So the first obvious thing is we need a clock. And the next thing we need is some data to store. Now, then we'll call it D, and it needs to be 16 bits wide. And then we need some output. And we'll call that Q. And then we need a way to tell the RAM what address we want this D to be stored in. So because we have uh, eight places that we can store this data, we need a way to address the number up to the number eight or eight spots. So that's, uh, it's, it's three binary bits, right? So uh, we need our data bits for our addressing to be three, and then we'll call this uh, AN for address in. And then, um, we need a way to tell the module when we want to load this data. You know, at what, what clock tick do we want that load to occur? So that means we need a load input. And let's see, did I change the output to an output? No, I always forget. So there we go. Okay, so now we have our ins and our outs. Uh, first obvious thing that we need to do is let's just wire up the clock. It's just sort of some housekeeping. Right, and then we can just wire the clock up like so. All right, next thing is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of get these out of the way for now. Uh, the next thing is the D input, uh, now you might think that we might need to multiplex the D because depending upon what address we put in, you know, the D needs to, either needs to go here, 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 etc. But in fact, it doesn't really matter because the only time any of these registers are going to be changed, it will be a result of whatever the value of first, whether load is high or low. And then secondly, it's dependent upon what the value of the address is. And so uh, we'll, we'll put those two dependencies together. And once those dependencies become true, then, um, you know, the value of D for that particular register will take on whatever D is. And it doesn't really matter that D is going to everything else because load, for example, will be low on all the rest of them. So let's just go ahead and wire uh, a D bus There we go. So yeah, so D, it's very simple then, just wires like that. Okay, so there's two, the two easy ones. Okay, so let's uh, wire up the functionality to get the load routed to the correct register based upon the value of the address in. And that is done through a demultiplexer. So we want to demultiplex address in routing the value of load appropriately. So let's grab a demultiplexer. And our load pin is simply routed to the one bit input of the demultiplexer because we just need to have one input. And then the number of data bits, uh, sorry, the number of 
select bits needs to match the number of bits on our address in. And address in gets wired to the select bit on the demultiplexer. And then each one of the outputs, 0 through 7, will respectively get routed to the various loads on each one of the registers. Okay, and then finally, the determination of which one of these registers are read at any given time is based upon whatever the value of address n is, presuming you're not loading. Well, in fact, if you are loading, you know, you're going to get the value of whatever is present at the register at the next clock tick because the load will have taken place of this of this address. But the point is, is that at all times, on the next clock tick, whatever the address of address n is should be present at the output. And so the way that's done is through a multiplexer. And let's flip that around. And so the so this multiplexer, uh, well, so first of all, it needs to be carrying 16 bits because each one of the registers has a six has 16 bits represented in them so the number of data bits we're passing through is 16 and then the number of select bits again matches the number of bits in address n so the select bits needs to be three and then the output of the mux is simply what our q is going to represent and uh, each one of the inputs to the multiplexer will be the respective output of each one of the registers. And then finally, the address in here needs to be simply the address in on this side. And I'll create a little... Uh, tunnel to kind of make this a little less messy and just show the use of the tunnel feature. It's going to be featured more heavily later on, but I'll just show it there. And then we can just copy and paste it. And then route it there like so. So let's build a user interface and test it. And so we'll start with our RAM 8. And uh, we'll start easy. We'll need a clock. And we'll need a load control pin. And we'll need some address pins, so we'll do that with one switch bank because we eventually are going to probably synthesize this. So I'll kind of try to follow the controls with the controls that are on my board. So we'll make our first, this is going to be on the board, this will be bid zero. So we'll do it just like that. And uh, we'll move these down a little bit. So that'll be our address in. And then well, just to get this out of the way, we'll put the load over here. And then we need a 16-bit data input. So we'll do that with two switches. And we need Again, a splitter.
like so. And then finally, we need to see some output. So uh, again, done with a splitter. And then we need LEDs. And put the labels on the bottom. I think we have everything we need. We can now uh, start the clock, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put the frequency up just a little bit, and then we can start ticking. And we don't expect to see anything because we don't have the load enabled and no switches are enabled. So let's just go ahead and uh, put a number, some random value. And then when I when load goes high, we should see this value appear over here. And uh, let's see, that's bit seven. Yeah, and over. Yeah, so that that looks correct. Now that's loaded into address zero. If we take load off, the value remains. That's good. But if we flip the address to address one then our lights go out because we haven't stored anything at address one and presumably the default value is zero. But what happens if we go back to zero, we should see, well, really this value appear and it's not because these switches are set, it's because that's the value that's in there and we'll prove that in a second. So if we turn this off, this value comes back. And then of course, if we turn all these off, the value should remain because we have load turned off. Right, so let's try, let's try another address, and uh, let's uh, let's let's set some other value. We'll set that top bank all high, and we'll put that in address one. So flip the load, and then all of those are now high. We turn the load off. So now if we switch between zero, there's that value we had put in originally, and we go back to address one there's that value. I took the RAM 8 module and went ahead and created a RAM 64 module. Again, going through the book, they implement a RAM 8 and a 64 and so forth until they get up to a RAM 16K, uh, which is the RAM size that the hack CPU requires. Uh, but I, I think even they do not implement the higher order RAM modules through a design in in uh, their own simulator. And similarly in Logisim, even adding these eight RAM modules and moving them around and so forth, uh, Logisim started behaving a little sluggishly. And so I can only imagine had I done this uh, to the next size up, how slow Logisim might have been. And if you think about it, I think th over a thousand bit components that make up these eight RAM modules, and those bit components have flip-flops in them and so forth. So it's a lot of state to have to propagate across uh, and so forth. So, but what I what I really wanted to show, um, you know, instead of showing me demonstrating building this, because it's really so similar to the RAM 8, uh, but I, I wanted to show the few differences. Uh, one difference is, of course, the RAM 8 has address in, whereas the register 16s that were used in the RAM 8 module do not. So obviously that's one difference. And as a result, address N is all wired together because one set of bits selects which one of these RAM 8 modules, and in fact, it's the upper three bits, which one of these RAM 8 modules is gonna store the value. And then the lower three bits are simply just fed into address N. And so it's 
okay to just simply parallel wire all the address in inputs and wire them to the lower three bits of the address in on the module. And so really this is the, this little area right here is the one difference between the RAM 8 and, or sorry, the RAM 64 and the RAM 8 implementation. And so we split six bits this time. We split the six, six bits up into three upper bits and three lower bits. And the three upper bits get routed to the multiplexer, sorry, the demultiplexer to determine which one of the RAM 8 modules uh, the input value is going to be uh, loaded into if indeed load is raised high. And then the lower three bits uh, get fed into the address in to determine within the RAM 8 which address in RAM 8 the value is going to be stored to or read from. And on the output side, similarly, the this multiplexer is wired in again to the upper three bits to select which one of the RAM 8 modules is to be piped through the output. So that's really the only difference. Now, of interest, I didn't synthesize the RAM 8 module because I wanted to do the RAM 64, and I want to do that because there are some differences of how you implement RAM on FPGAs. This is one technique, and then there's another technique, and each technique has different utilization patterns on the fabric of the FPGA that uh, really matter, especially when you get to, you know, larger and larger RAM sizing. So first, let's synthesize this design and take a look at the resource utilization on the FPGA. Okay, synthesis complete. If we go to the console, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. And the Logisim designers kind of made this console window so you can't look at it very easily and it'd be really nice if there was a copy, like a right click and it just copied the whole thing. Somewhere is a table that sort of gives you what all has been used. 